We're coming to the last part of the book of Mark, my sermon series in the book of Mark, and I trust that you guys have gleaned much out of the, the teachings in this wonderful gospel that Jesus brought forward, and, and um, we're coming into the final days, and, and as you know, uh, for those that were here around Easter time, we jumped ahead, we kind of jumped ahead, and we did the Easter story as based in Mark, so we're just coming to that point now in Mark chapter 14, where Jesus is preparing uh, to go to the cross. He's finished his earthly ministry, and he's given his disciples the fullness of teaching that he intended to give them. Um, of course, there is some more lessons that they would have to learn through his, his crucifixion, uh, the scenario of his crucifixion and uh, of his resurrection and everything past that point. But up to this point, Jesus had given them the bread that they needed in their spirits to understand what was going to be taking place. Now, they didn't totally get it at this time, but, um, but Jesus was preparing them for that. Now, when we look at, uh, at the final portion here before Jesus was crucified, um, we, see, we see the full character of God on display. And, uh, you know, Jesus Christ came and was the living word of God. When you looked at Jesus, you saw what God was like with skin on. You saw the living God in, 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 in your midst. And, and those people saw the light. Not everyone uh, recognized him for who he was, but, but his light shone in the darkness of the world of that day. I mean, in, in Isaiah chapter 9, Jesus had it truly fulfilled um, what Isaiah chapter 9, 2 said. And, and Isaiah 9, 2 says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And the Apostle John actually speaks of the fulfillment of this prophecy in Jesus in John chapter 1, 14, where he says, the Word, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And in my message today, we're going to be focusing in on these final preparations that Jesus was making before he would offer himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. Would you turn with me, if you have Bibles, to Mark chapter 14? And our text this morning is Mark 14, 1 to 26. Starting with verse 1. The scriptures will be on the overhead for those who want to follow along there. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and to kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or people may riot. So the time at this point in history, the time had come for the annual Passover celebration and the feast, what the Jews called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And those who had put their mind to killing Jesus because he was interrupting their idea of who the Messiah should be. The Sadducees and uh, that group had an idea of what they wanted the Messiah to look like. The Pharisees had another idea of what the Messiah was to look like. And Jesus looked like neither imagined the Messiah to be. So they wanted to kill him. So they schemed to arrest him. Why did they want to arrest him? Well, he was a threat. He was a threat to them, to their way of doing things. And he called them out. One thing you see, and one thing we see when we look back on the Gospels and we see uh, the teachings of Christ, you know, what got Jesus more upset than anything was the hypocrisy of dead religion. He called it, you know, whitewashed tomb religion. You know, 
filled with death on the inside, filled with dead man's bones on the inside. It looked all polished on the outside, but it wasn't, it wasn't true. It wasn't true hearts uh, towards God. So they wanted to kill him because he stepped on their toes and, and he wasn't what they desired him to be. But also they knew, I mean, there, there could have been a riot during the Passover feast if they decided to arrest him during this time. I mean, as, as you remember, when Jesus, just prior to this, entered the city of Jerusalem, um, there were certain people that were saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they were laying down palm branches. They were calling him the son of David. And, and they believed him to be coming to Jerusalem to set up his kingdom. Now, a lot of them didn't understand what he was doing with that. But um, nevertheless, there were people that were still looking to Jesus as their, uh, their Messiah. So they didn't want to cause this big riot. Now the Passover in Israel was the celebration of God's final act of deliverance of his people from slavery in Egypt. Now, uh, maybe you're new to reading the Bible and you've never been told this before. Passover, what does that mean? Well, Passover. Um, on the very first Passover, the 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 children of Israel, the, the nation of Israel was in captivity in the land of Egypt. They had, they had gone there during a great famine under Joseph. And, and they had lived there for 400 years. And, and they multiplied. God blessed them. And the Egyptians, uh, oh, these people are here. They're a great workforce to, to build our infrastructure. So they turned the nation of Israel into slaves. And they, they were crying out to God because of the brutality of the slavery. And Pharaoh, the leader of the Egyptians, Moses came to him and, under God's authority and asked Pharaoh to let his people go. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened. His, his heart and disposition towards God was hardened. He said, no, I'm not going to let them go. Of course, he, he stood a, to lose a lot of free labor if he let them go. So God actually answered his hardness in his response by saying, okay, well, you don't want to let them go, then this is going to happen. Then there was a series of plagues that came upon the land of Egypt, one right after the other. Ten plagues, in fact, fell on Egypt. And on the ninth plague, um, God advised Moses that he planned on sending a final plague on the land to make Pharaoh uh, change his mind and let the people go. So they were under this brutality of, of um, slavery and, and, and God shared with Moses and he said, well, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to send death, a death angel, into the land and um, everyone is going to be visited by this death angel. Every family is going to be visited by this death angel and every firstborn son of every household will die. And this is the judgment that I'm going to bring upon the land. But God had mercy upon his people. See, the Israelites were God's representative nation to the world. And his, his heart was towards these people as his representatives to the earth. And they were his children. So he, he said to them, um, my desire is not to send death upon you guys. Because you're my children. Death will come upon the rest of the nation because of their disobedience. But for you, if you take a pure lamb, a lamb, and, and, and you sacrifice the lamb to me, and you take the blood of that lamb, and, and you, you smear that blood of the lamb over the thresholds, the entrance points to your houses, when I send this plague and the death angel comes around, he will visit your door and he'll see the blood of the lamb and it'll be a sign and he will pass over that house. So that house that has the blood of the lamb applied over the, the threshold will be spared from death. Now, of course, we look in the book of Exodus. In Exodus 12, 13, this was the instruction. And this is what God said to Moses. He said, the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, 
I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. And this is what happened the very first Passover night. As God had told Moses, Moses instructed the people to obey the Lord, and they did. And they put the blood of the lamb, the sacrificed lambs, over their doorposts. And that night came, and the, angel, the death angel that God sent into the land visited. And that final plague resulted in the death of every firstborn in Egypt who did not have the blood of the lamb applied over the doorposts. And after that time, Pharaoh let the people go. So this is a celebration, the Passover feast. Every time the Jews celebrated the Passover, they would remember their deliverance from slavery, that they were spared from death. God released his people from slavery. And, you know, I've told people this in my congregation here before, and if you're new, um, the Old Testament um, points to to one thing. The entirety of the Old Testament is pointing to one thing. And the entirety of the New Testament is also pointing to one thing. And that thing that, the, that both the Old and the New Testament are pointing to are the same, one and the same. That is God's sacrifice. They point to Jesus. They point to God's Son who would, who would take the, the sin of the world upon his shoulders. And the Old Testament points towards Christ. And the New Testament points back to Christ. As the author, the perfecter of faith, the living word of God, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, Jesus Christ is Lord over all. From the end, all the way back to the beginning. All the way from the beginning to the end and everything in between. Everything points to Jesus and this is the beautiful part of the text that we're going to be looking at this morning, is it points to God's plan of salvation. Now, if you remember, when Jesus first started his earthly ministry, um, there was a man sent from God. His name was John the Baptist. And, and he, he was a precursor, preparing the way for Jesus to come. And when Jesus, it says in the book of John, actually, when Jesus came, when Jesus came to be baptized, he looked, John the Baptist looked, and the Holy Spirit spoke to him. And he said to the people, he said, look, look, he said in John 1, 29, he says, look, Jesus, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's what John said at the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. And here, as Jesus is preparing himself for his fulfillment of mission on the earth, we see that it's falling right on the festival, the feast of the Passover and the feast of unleavened bread. This is not by accident. This is coordinated by Almighty God, pointing to the cross, pointing to Jesus Christ as the centerpiece of history, as the centerpiece and the focus of salvation for the world. In fact, Jesus was the one whom Isaiah the prophet proclaimed in Isaiah 53, 7. It, it's written, he was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. Like a sheep before it shares is silent, so he opened out his mouth. And further to that, in Isaiah 53, 10 and 11, it stated concerning the coming Savior that God was going to send into the world. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul shall he see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous one, shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he, who? The Messiah. He shall bear their iniquities. He shall be the sin bearer. 
He shall be the sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb. So the approaching Passover celebration was perfectly timed by God. And it was the sign written in Exodus pointing to the ultimate sacrifice of God's Messiah, his one and only son who would die instead of the people to pay the penalty of disobedience and death so that we would not have to experience death, but we would be granted life and freedom from slavery. In the first Passover, those lambs were sacrificed and the blood of those innocent lambs was spilt to cover over the the lives of the people. It was a representative. It was a sign. You see, in Exodus it says, and I will give you a sign. Well, what is the sign of? The sign isn't just of what happened in Egypt. The sign was, no. The sign was a precursor to what God was going to do ultimately through the Savior of the world. Now, in addition to the Passover, so the Passover signified and was celebrated to signify the passing over of God's wrath on whoever was covered by the penalty that was paid by the innocent lamb that was, was slaughtered. See, this is the meaning behind the work of Jesus. He is the lamb of God, as John said, who takes away the sin of the world. And in addition, addition to the Passover, in tandem with the Passover celebration, there was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, if you're not familiar with Jewish customs and history, maybe you go, what is this unleavened bread feast? Like, bread without leaven? That's like flat bread, right? We're going to be having communion later in the service here. And we've got some traditional Jewish matzah, which is bread without any leaven. We're going to be passing that to believers to partake in remembrance of Jesus. But many don't know what the, the significance of Jesus um, being involved in his giving of his life during the festival of the unleavened bread. The Passover, people get that. Some, some people get that. But a lot of people don't understand what the unleavened bread is all about. So I'm going to explain it a little bit. So after the Passover... After the final plague and the people of Israel were released by Pharaoh to, to leave the land of slavery, okay, um, they wandered into a desert. And God promised them a promised land that if they followed his leading, he would lead them to a land filled with milk and honey. A promised land that would be their very own land that they would possess. But in between Egypt, the slavery, and the promised land was a great desert. And in this desert, there was no natural food sources to sustain these people. So they found themselves wandering into the desert, and some of them complained. But what did God do? He understood that when he called his people out of slavery in Egypt, that they're going to get hungry. So he made this arrangement with them and sent them bread from heaven. Manna fell down on the ground and was collected by the people to eat. It was a supernatural miracle. These people were sustained by God from bread that came from heaven. He was the maker of this bread. Bread. It was God's God was the baker of this bread. He was the maker of this bread. And they were only to collect it and gather it and consume it and give thanks. And uh, this was the bread from heaven. And it didn't have yeast in it. And throughout the scriptures, well, what's the significance of yeast? Well, throughout scriptures, there are references to yeast. And, and yeast is, is likened unto sin. And, and, and yeast, if, you, if you're a baker, I'm, I'm not much of a baker. I flop everything. But my wife knows how to bake, man. She bakes real good. And maybe you're a guy and you know how to bake. Good for you. That's great. 
I, I, I'm not very successful at it, but I've done it a bit. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's okay, but not good. <laughs> anyway, so when you put yeast into bread, though, and you mix it around, the yeast actually causes the bread to rise. And it spreads throughout the whole batch of dough. And, and the reason why the Bible teaches that sin is like yeast is that if there's sin, it has this habit, nasty habit of working itself through the whole batch of dough. So if there's unresolved sin inside of me, it corrupts me from one end to the other. It just, I'm corrupted. And some people say, oh, I'm pretty good. You know, I'm pretty good. You're not good enough. People say that they're good enough to, to meet with God. They overestimate their own holiness and underestimate God's righteousness. God is holy. And he can't be in a place where there's sin. So the sin issue needs to be taken care of. The bread that we eat from, that is given to us by God, must be unleavened. It must be pure. It must be holy. It must be undefiled by sin. So it's interesting that after the Passover, the feast of the unleavened bread celebrated the, the freedom that God brought through the blood of the lamb. And in the Passover, uh, it worked into the feast of the unleavened bread. Actually, they celebrated the two together because after they went into the desert, they didn't have anything to eat. And God provided them sustenance, food for them so that they wouldn't starve while they were journeying from the land of slavery, which they had been freed from, to the land of promise, which was the land flowing with milk and honey on the other side of the desert. You getting the picture here? This is a mirror image of our lives. When you're, when you're, before you come to know the Savior, you're a slave to sin. You're a slave to your, your flesh, the desires of your sin nature. You're a slave to that. But the blood of the Lamb provides a way of escape so that your sin is, is, is taken care of and death passes over you and you're set free from slavery. And then you're on the road to the promised land. Well, what's the promised land? I can tell you this much. We celebrated someone who crossed over into the promised land yesterday. We had this, this uh, funeral here for Mrs. Bermatoff. Or Mrs. Uh, Zay, uh, oh, my. I just, Zaitsev. No, uh, Ivanov. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> my mind just went blank. Mrs. Ivanov, H Helen Bermatoff's mother, went to be with the Lord. And she knew Jesus. And she's on the other side. She's in the land of promise that God's promised. She's wander wandered through the desert. She's walked through the desert. And now God has brought her into the promised land. See, the mirror of this in Scripture? Okay, so Jesus, his sacrifice was to be during the Passover feast and the feast of unleavened bread. Well, what's the significance of the unleavened bread in Jesus? Well, remember when Jesus was walking on the earth, and he did his miracles before. We talked about this in the earlier chapters of Mark. What did he do? The people were hungry, and he said, the, you know, you feed them to his disciples, and they're like, we can't feed these people. He says, bring what you have to me. So he bring, they bring what they have to Jesus, and in one miracle, there's five loaves and two fishes, right? We'll talk about that. Jesus blesses this hands it back to the disciples, they break it off, and all, all the people that were there were fed from these small things. <laughs> well, after the feeding of the 5,000, everyone's going, what is this? My goodness. Can you imagine the miracle? And everyone going, what does this mean? What does this mean? And the people were still confused, and they're like, well, it, this has to be from God, but what's this? There's got to be some more follow-up stuff that you can tell us that shows that this is from God. So in John 6, 30 to 40, they, they asked him a question. They, so this is just after the, the thousands of people were fed miraculously from the, the few loaves and fishes that were presented. So in John 6, 30 to 40, they asked him, what sign will you give us that we may see it and believe you? He just fed 5,000 men without any 
any provisions. There wasn't the save on foods down the street there. It was a miracle. Yet after the miracle, immediately after the miracle, they're asking for another sign. What sign then will you give us that we may believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus, this is the answer. And this is the key to what, what's happening here in Mark. At the end of Mark here. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you bread from heaven. But it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. <laughs> and what did Jesus say in response? He said, they're, they're thinking, well, hey, it'd be great if we didn't have to go to the grocery store and we could just sort of hang out with you and whew, have all these free meals. <laughs> but they didn't understand. And Jesus declared, he said this, he said, I am. You notice how it's infused with I am? I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. Doesn't that sound like the promised land? For my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him should have eternal life. They look to the Passover lamb whose blood covers over sin and, and makes it so that death passes over that household who trusts in the Lord and who obeys him. For my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise them up at the last day. What a beautiful passage of scripture. So John also reveals to us in the gospel that he wrote that Jesus was not only the bread of heaven, he was also the living word of God. In our text today in Mark, we see how the spirit of God was preparing Jesus to shed his blood as the Passover lamb to prepare, to prepare for pain for the sins of the world, to give himself as that pure uncorrupted, sinless, unleavened bread of heaven so that whoever would partake of the bread that comes from heaven would have sustenance on the journey between the time when they were set free from slavery to the promised land that God was calling them to. There's a song out there that sings, all I need is you. All I need is you. All I need is Jesus. That's all I need. Why? Because he is the bread of life. If you have spiritual hunger today, the bread of life gives you life. The bread of life satisfies the spiritual hunger that nothing else can satisfy. He is sustenance. We continue in our text from verse 3 in Mark 14. While he was in Bethany reclining at the table at the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those who were present were indignant to one another. Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you. And you can help them at any time that you want. <laughs> 
but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, whenever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. That prophecy comes in fulfillment as well today. For we, we learn in John's parallel gospel, in John 12, 1 to 8, we learn that this lady that did this thing for Jesus was none other than Mary, the sister of Martha, the sister of Lazarus, whom Jesus had just raised from the dead prior to coming to Jerusalem. You see, Mary, she had witnessed Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, you will never die. She saw this with her own eyes and she believed. And this breaking of the bottle of perfume, it was sealed. And in the ancient times, they used to carry perfumes, oil, perfume oils in alabaster jars. Why? Because it was almost like currency. It was almost like, um, almost like gold currency. And oftentimes people would pass a, a jar of expensive perfume down from family member to family member through generations, and it would be like an investment. You could sell it at any time. It was easily liquidable. Uh, you, you could liquidate it. You could sell it at any time, and, and it would bring a lot of sustenance with it. There'd be, there's money involved with this. We're told here that this bottle of expensive perfume was worth more than a year's wages for the common person there. More than a year's wages. <laughs> Mary, I'm sure she was probably not that wealthy. She brought everything that she had to Jesus. Why? Because she understood who he was. She saw him raise her brother from the dead. She saw her brother come forth when he said, Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man who had been dead for four days stepped out. <sighs> See, everyone else was caught up on things. They're looking, they're looking too close at things. They weren't seeing the big picture, but Mary saw the big picture. She didn't care what anyone else thought. She brought what God had given to her, and that was life. So her life was God's. She said, Jesus, I give you what I have. This is what I have. And she gave out of the bottom of her heart to Jesus, to honor him. See, because when Jesus came in riding on that colt, and they said, Hosanna, they were celebrating the coming of a king. And, G and although people didn't understand that Jesus wasn't going to be the king that they expected in the physical at that point, Mary understood that, in fact, he was the king. He was the resurrection and the life. And it was only proper that she should anoint the king of heaven. And it was costly. So she brought what she had, and it was costly, and she gave it to him. We need to take a lesson from this. God gives us life. Do we really believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? And if we do, what kind of mark is that going to have on how we live? Are we going to be like Mary, who brings what we have and says, it's all yours, God? Or are we going to say, this is mine? disciples, they didn't get it even. They, did, they, they didn't get it. They said, well, this, this is worth money. It's going to cost like a year's wages for what? For just, a, uh, just it being spilled out over the Lord? Yeah, yeah it's a great idea, great idea, but, but my goodness, couldn't we have done it a little bit differently? In those households, in those days, it was customary when you invited someone over to your house to put a little bit of uh, anointing oil or perfume on that person, just a dab. But she took the whole jar and broke the whole jar and poured the whole thing over the Messiah's head. Because she knew. And she didn't care what they said. Oh yeah, there, were, there, there was maybe some people saying, aren't you going too far with this? Aren't you a little bit of a fanatic? You're a fanatic, given all that you are to Christ like that. He would have wanted you to do something else. 
Jesus is like, hold on. She's done what was honoring to me. Yes, I am your king. But you don't realize this, that I'm not the king that you thought would come and would throw off the Romans and establish the throne right then and there in Jerusalem. No, I am the king that has come to die instead of you. My kingdom is not of this world. I've come to make a way for you to be reconciled to God, although you were like sheep who had gone astray, each of us unto our own way. I came to rescue you and bring you back to the shepherd of your heart and make a way for that. God did that. That's how much he loves us. Do we recognize how much he loves us? Or are we kind of like the other disciples who are like, hey, it's okay to give a little bit to God, but hey, that's just too much. Sometimes people approach their Christian faith like that. God's compartmentalized. This is my little Christian part here. There's a little tiny box here that belongs to him, and everything else is mine. Well, guess who was at the core of all of this going on right here where the disciples were saying, hey, they rebuked her sharply. Guess who was at the core of that? You know who's at the core of that? Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot was at the core of that. And probably he was, I, I don't know, it doesn't say if he was the first one to say something, but he was among those men who objected to what Mary had done. And why Judas? Judas was in the relationship with Jesus for what he could get out of the deal. He was following Jesus because Jesus was going to be the king. Jesus was going to take the throne of David. And he wanted to be tagged along with that so that he could benefit for himself what was taking place. And all of a sudden, Jesus goes, she's breaking the perfume over my head to prepare for my burial. I think there was a light that turned on in Judas. And he's like, hold on a second here. You're not going to, well, I thought maybe you're speaking an allegory, Jesus, or something. I don't know what he was thinking. But you're not going to actually uh, take over the land here and become the second David and be this powerful military leader here. You're not going to do that? Hmm. Well, guess what that means? If you're just here to die, I don't get a cut. I don't get the money that's going to come from being shoulder to shoulder with the king. So guess what? Guess what? Mark 14.10 tells us. Next verse. After Mary did this, and Jesus said, no, she's doing the right thing. Judas Iscariot, it says, then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. If I'm not going to get money from the king, then I'm going to get money from selling the king out. I might as well get something out of the deal. He went to the chief. Can you imagine one of the disciples that watched Jesus raise dead people? Like he was there with, with the rest of the disciples when Jesus, was ra when Jesus raised Lazarus too. But look at Mary's heart versus Judas's heart. Look at the two. They're polar opposites. Judas approached his walk with Jesus as to what he could get out of the deal. Well, Mary approached her walk with Jesus as what she could bring to the king. People. Sometimes when we come into faith in Christ and church, we get steered wrong. Yeah. God promises he's going to take care of us. He's going to supply all of our needs, and he's going to lead us through the desert, through the, through the desert to the promised land. He promises that. But it's not going to be as you think. What were the children of Israel, some of them, doing when they are in the desert and the manna was falling? They're complaining, saying, this isn't what we desired. Egypt had all these... Uh, 
fresh vegetables and uh, look at the marketplaces in Egypt that we left. You take us out into this wilderness to die? What's wrong with you, Moses? What's wrong with you, God? You just take us out of slavery to make it worse for us. Meanwhile, every day, the bread of heaven is falling. And all of their needs are met. No, this isn't the promised land. <laughs> you, you're not in the promised land right now, but you're on your way there. But God is with you in your journey. He's with you. He's with me in my journey. And he's promised being the bread of life that he will satisfy our hunger, that he will lead us to the places that we need to be on route. And he's going to take care of us. Why? Because he's good. He's a loving God. So, Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. I'm going to ask at this time, before we move into communion, that um, our board would just come forward to prepare for communion.